so this is the title of my talk today uh, and uh, all the work is the people that are involved in this uh, in this study i have to mention that all the work uh, has been led by one of well, smart postdoc in the lab, Kartik Ayer. Uh, and the support is, as Andrew mentioned, some conflict of interest. So <clears throat> my, uh, just to, yeah. my, my general interest in the brain stimulation was uh, uh, on the use of this technique to try to understand uh, how uh, local change in uh, uh, circuits or neural circuits that uh, generally uh, underpin some uh, functionally specific uh, function may impact uh, the whole system, so the whole brain. Um, and the question was at the beginning, try to see if uh, these uh, networks effect were selective uh, to networks that support the same function that the targeted uh, brain region or were more diffuse, if they were uh, driven by the context or not. Uh, so this question, of course, uh, of uh, critical importance to understand how our brain work, but also have a, a direct implication to the development of therapies, because we know that uh, mental disorder, or symptoms of mental disorder, uh, often map into uh, the change in the activity of brain, these brain systems and uh, understand how we can modulate or restore the normal activity of these brain systems using this uh, focal, focal uh, stimulation is critical uh, uh, to develop, to push forward the therapeutic use of this technique. So today I'm gonna to present you uh, the results of a study uh, that uh, has been uh, uh, conducted by uh, our friends uh, in, in the United States, and some of the data has already been published uh, recently in this paper. Uh, basically, the experiment is a within subject design where individuals come in for a first uh, uh, baseline uh, TMS, uh, sorry, baseline uh, uh, MRI session. Uh, in the MRI, people were asked to perform a working memory task, so a simple end back task, one back and two back. And after this MRI session, their pattern of brain activity was mapped. And uh, um, it was uh, for each individual, it was decided to stimulate a region on uh, that a region that is involved in, uh, in the task. So in this case, the parietal cortex, you can see here in blue and also a region that uh, was not involved in the execution of this working memory task. And this is the S1 uh, somatosensory region here in black. Then uh, uh, individual came back for two independent uh, uh, visits uh, before entering the scanner and doing again uh, the task. People receive uh, CTBS, so the standard 600 pulse CTBS uh, on S1 or parietal cortex in a uh, uh, counterbalance fashion. So the idea was to try to understand if uh, the stimulation on uh, the system that uh, is involved in processing uh, or supporting this working memory behavior is a specific or not. And also try to understand a little bit more what's the effect of this stimulation on uh, the whole system. So to to approach this question, we use a, a rather different approach compared to what is standard use, so like connectivity, effective connectivity, or, or simple general linear model for activations. We use a, a method that has been described in this recent paper in Nature, Nature Biotechnology, and it consists in uh, the ability to uh, project these high dimensional data into a low compress, uh, low dimensional space. So I, I don't have the time to go into the detail of these methods, but basically for the, for, the, for the purpose of this talk, it may just be important to keep in mind that this basically allow to project this high dimensional data uh, that come from fMRI into a simple uh, low dimensional topological space. And the analysis of this topology can help us to understand what actually is going on 
when uh, the system is perturbed in a, in a given location. So the first thing that we did is uh, uh, try to reconstruct this low dimensional manifold. And uh, with the, dimension, the low dimensional manifold, uh, we used three main dimensions that here we describe as phase one, phase two, and phase three. So the three dimension explain the large majority of the data from memory, I think is over uh, 85%. Um, so you can see uh, this is the phase one dimension projected back into the, uh, into the brain, the phase two into the brain and phase three. Red uh, dots are uh, the region, the load in the region linked to one back. So the simple low load working memory task. And uh, uh, the blue, we have the uh, uh, high load working memory task. And this we have the baseline condition. Again, here we just look at the correct trials. Uh, the somatosensory condition and the parietal condition. Overall, uh, there is not much that you can see from this figure. Uh, you can perhaps appreciate that phase one is mainly involving subcortical structure across uh, the three conditions and the parietal regions that are the ones that have been stimulated. Uh, the second dimension is mainly frontal. Uh, and the third dimension, you have this occipital occipital parietal and temporal uh, region that are involved. To ensure that these uh, low dimensional construction made some kind of sense, uh, we uh, did this kind of now standard meta-analytic uh, analysis to try to map how this loading of the dimension into the cortex a mirror known uh, function in the brain. And we were pleased to see that uh, uh, our three dimension highly map into or highly linked to working memory, visual attention, cognitive control, and numerical cognition, all things that make sense in the context of a uh, NBAC task. And they were loading very poorly into uh, motor function, pain, and sleep function. Again, this to just sanity check to ensure that uh, our low dimensional construction uh, still capture some functionally meaningful properties. Then uh, we projected that when we analyze this uh, low dimensional manifold that are represented here with these colors in uh, independent space. So in this uh, slide, you have the baseline condition, the S1 condition and the parietal condition for one back at the top and two back condition. So the manifold, each dot represent a region in the brain. We have 333 regions. And they are color coded based on uh, broad uh, whole brain networks. And you can appreciate it that overall, uh, once you have to transition from a low working memory condition to a high working memory condition, there is a, an expansion of this manifold. Interestingly, though, what we observe is that following this perturbation of the parietal cortex, uh, this expansion seems significantly greater compared to what we observe in the other two conditions. So to further explore a little bit, what does it mean, this expansion? So if we focus for a second here on panel A, you can see that in the baseline condition, again, for correct and incorrect trials for one back and two back, we see that uh, uh, yeah, there is an expansion that seems uh, to happen when you do uh, when the load increase. And also this expansion seems to distinguish at least at the group level, uh, the trial that are incorrect from the trial that are correct. When we go into the IPS condition here on the right, top right corner, uh, you can see that this uh, uh, expansion, uh, the pattern of expansion is similar. So what's happening is similar, but uh, the magnitude at which this expansion occur is significantly greater. So the system seems to react in a more dramatic fashion to the change in load and to the errors. This is, uh, you can appreciate this um, expansion in this plot here. So uh, the uh, red and the red is S1 condition, the uh, black is the baseline condition. And you can see that in a IPS condition, this is a two back there is an obvious uh, 
expansion of this trajectory across the three, the three main dimensions so phase one, phase two, and phase three. When you compare, when you compare uh, more formally this expansion, so here you have the total distance of the manifold. So, and uh, so there's correct minus incorrect trials. So I mean, slightly positive value here means that the manifold is expanded in the correct versus the incorrect. So between the Bayesian and the S1 condition, there is no much difference, but uh, uh, in the IPS condition, there is a, a significant dramatic increase in uh, uh, the uh, length of the trajectory of the manifolds. Just to dig in a little bit more into uh, this manifold effect, so if we look just at the IPS condition, so the condition has the greater expansion, and you look at the three dimension, it seems that the one that uh, uh, react the most in terms of uh, change in fMRI signals is uh, the uh, phase one, so the first dimension. And as I mentioned, the first dimension is where IPS is actually located. Uh, particularly when we look at this phase one dimension at the region that uh, belong in this uh, phase one dimension compare, you, you can see that uh, the associative regions in uh, Bayesian and S1 uh, are significantly lower compared to the number of associative regions that get more activated in uh, the IPS condition. So IPS condition seems to drive the activity and also the pattern of interaction of these associative regions with the rest of the system. When we look uh, at what's happening in terms of what CTBS does on IPS, and I know this is, a, is, a, is a, always a, a scary analysis to do considering the variability in, uh, in these protocols, but here we got, uh, if you want, quite lucky in the sense that compared to baseline, uh, CTBS seems to induce a reduction in fMRI signal. Here we look at power of the ball signal uh, in pretty much all participants, 15 participants, except two that show an opposite effect. And uh, uh, what we found is that this reduction of the magnitude of uh, activity in uh, uh, this region is linearly related to the uh, manifold trajectory. So there is a, a kind of a, linear relationship between the uh, change in the activity in, at the local level and at the whole system level. So what all does, what all this means in terms of behavior? So overall, uh, the group level, it seems that uh, an expansion of the manifold seems to support uh, uh, performance, uh, correct performance and accommodate cognitive load. Uh, but let's see at the individual level. So here, what you have plot in panel A is the 17 individual and the length of the manifold trajectory. I should remember you that uh, these manifold are significantly smaller for the baseline and SWAT condition. And there is this greater or uh, larger manifold in the IPS. In this context, it seems that there is uh, people that uh, individual that have a longer manifold in the Bayesian and S1 condition are the one that perform better in the uh, two uh, back task. On the other hand, in this expanded manifold, uh, we have an opposite gradient. So this also confirmed by these correlations in which uh, a participant that perform best are the one that are able to constrain the manifold uh, a little bit more. So in sum, what uh, I hope I show you and, and convince that this happening is that the expansion of the manifold seems to support working memory performance. And this is obvious from base and S1 condition. Uh, CTBS on the manifold, so meaning on the parietal cortex, uh, caused this greater expansion of the manifold. So this, the whole system uh, seems to accommodate this perturbation by expanding. Uh, and interestingly, uh, this expansion, while it is compensatory or can, is needed to preserve performance in a, a normal condition or when the stimulation is off the task uh, region, when it's on the task region, uh, the ability to maintain the uh, 
expansion of this manifold within certain functional limit seems to be critical to uh, preserve behavior. So overall, I hope that this new approach uh, will give us uh, some extra, uh, extra tools or extra way to understand how a local perturbation in the activity can uh, map or results in change in how the whole system interact uh, between itself and how this system support uh, our behavior. Thank you very much.